Good evening, everybody. Welcome, and uh, thanks again for coming. Um, tonight is the concluding night of, of, of our mission, and uh, boy, it seems like I've spent every night in church this week. Uh, but no, I want to thank you all for, uh, for being here, uh, not just during the week, this past week, but for Monsignor Baker and for Father Ritz. I've been in contact with uh, Monsignor Baker and uh, he was just so overjoyed, and I mean that sincerely, to be able to be here. But I think with both Monsignor Baker and Father Ritz, you can tell the passion that they both had for the saints that they both spoke about. Um, this week, as we know, we had to put on the brakes real hard and hit our heads off the dashboards. Uh, but we were able to rebound. Um, this week, we were supposed to have Dominican friar, Father Jonathan Kalish, with us, who is the supreme chaplain of the Knights of Columbus and their director of religious services, uh, to be with us to talk about uh, Father Michael McGivney, the founder of the Knights of Columbus one night, and Father Kalish is also an expert on uh, St. John Paul II. Uh, the reason why we are putting the two of them together is because uh, John Paul II, of all the popes, utilized the Knights of Columbus most during his 30-year pontificate as one of his arms of charity to help take care of the world. And it was through much of the efforts of the Knights of Columbus that uh, humanitarian aid that was sent to Poland at the time of the communist occupation allowed Poland to once again become a free nation and to be able to regain its Catholic status. But as we know, because of the uh, war in Ukraine right now, um, Father Kalish was sent by the Knights of Columbus to go to Poland to help oversee the Knights of Columbus humanitarian efforts down through the Ukraine. Um, so he kind of left us in a lurch, and, but an excusable lurch. And the other night at dinner, um, I said to uh, both Father Finland and to Father Carroll, um, you know, let me just throw this idea by you. Maybe I should just let things go. And the next thing you know, uh, Father Finland has his phone now. And Father Jim was looking at me like a puppy dog. And uh, they said, why do you have to cancel anything? And uh, as we know, Father Jim on Monday night gave us a beautiful homily, a very meaningful homily on, with our Mass for praying for the Ukraine. And many of you were here last night for the ecumenical prayer service that we had to pray for peace in the Ukraine. Um, I was told uh, by the Supreme Navigator of the Knights of Columbus that I need to apologize because I went and called you Catholics with cooties. You know, um, I call myself a Catholic with cooties. But I, I want to say this because uh, you were all here in Mass last night, and I was really thrilled that as many of our people and as many of our Catholic neighbors were here last night. You know, sometimes it gets to be a little bit more embarrassing when you have all these visitors coming to the church and our own people aren't here, so thank you for doing that. Um, I think it's been a good week. Um, once again, uh, we have baskets up front. We'll continue to put more baskets out. Uh, but if anyone would like to donate medical items or hygiene items, and I'm going to try sending those over to Poland uh, to help the refugees, because many of them don't have toothbrushes, toothpaste, uh, soap to wash with, uh, tissues, all those things, bandages, aspirin. We're going to try sending that over there to try and help them just start a little bit of a contribution. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, I want to uh, thank Mary Lou and the choir for 
wonderful job. Uh, you know, they did a great job uh, for Mass on Monday, and last week was outstanding, and we really uh, showed the people from town what a great choir we have, so I was very grateful for that. Uh, during the course of the week, uh, we had uh, priests in for dinner, certainly Monday night was a big night. We had uh, Father Rogers and uh, we had Father Barnabas and we had the deacon and a couple other priests and uh, parishioners volunteered to cook for me all those nights and I really do appreciate the fact that uh, we had you and the meals were delicious. So thank you very much. Most especially I want to thank all of you once again for being here. Um, tonight um, we have a, a very dear friend of mine. Um, I've known him since he was a seminarian at, uh, at St. Charles. Um, and we've been close ever since. Um, I was not in seminary with him. I was a baby priest at the time. But I was very grateful that uh, he befriended me and times looked to me as a mentor. And uh, I guess there's times I tormented him too. Uh, but our friendship goes back some almost 40 years. And uh, you know, aside from Tim Pellish, I really don't have a friendship that long. So I'm very grateful for Father Finland. Um, Father Finland um, is a pastor of uh, John the 23rd in Tamakla and also St. Richard's in Barnesville. Uh, he was another one of us that has two parishes to worry about. Um, Father Finland uh, saw the light uh, because when it came time for him to move into theology, he chose Mount St. Mary's. So, and we know that Mount St. Mary's is the best seminary in the country. Um, but Father Finland, with a lot of his leadership, even as a deacon and a student, uh, helped guide the way for improving seminary education. And he now serves on the Rector's Council and the President's Council down at the Mount. One of the, the things that he also uh, managed to do, and I don't know how, when you look at the schedule of the seminary at the Mount, how he managed to do it, especially since he was always such an underachiever. Uh, twice a week, he would drive down to Washington, D.C., where he attended the John Paul II Institute. And it was through that that he was able to further his education, and so uh, he too has gotten a very decent education in John Paul. So while we might not have Father Kalish, uh, we have him to conclude our mission with tonight. Uh, one other point, and then I'll turn it over to Mary Lou. Uh, a number of people have said it's a shame the Dominican couldn't be here. I know the Knights of Columbus have been a big support for me, as they always are with so many important projects. And we're going to work on trying to get Father Kalish back, uh, maybe when the weather gets warmer over the summer or something, to talk about the work of Father John McGivney. I think it's important, I think you all agree, uh, understanding the lives of these people of our time and how they became the saints is fascinating. So Mrs. Wisniewski, what do you have planned? Please join with me, hymn number 191, in the cradle book. Remain with me, hymn number 191.
thank you for being here this evening as we join together at this time of a parish mission. So my hope is while this is a presentation format, um, there is so much we could look at with the life of St. John Paul II, but we can, I'm going to try to keep this with some spiritual insight that we can take from the, tonight's talk as well. But I would like to start in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary. Holy Lord Grace, the Lord, Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So tonight, I'm not to say jump on the stage, there's a lot of cramming to cover at first, but I kind of played a little around the topic a little bit. It's pontificate in European, I call it theopolitics, rather than geopolitics. Uh, the theo is our word for God. That's where we get theology and the things from. And so it, it was a, a God-centered politics for St. John Paul II. It's just not a, you know, kind of a common secular politics. He, he understood that you know, human beings are political creatures. And we live together in societies, and those societies should reflect the core values of us as, as Christians. And so, we'll play around that title a little bit. So you might get a lot about geopolitics today. Where is this? Is theopolitics. And oh, you know, St. John Paul II, uh, there's also a bit of an issue in, in age. And you consider he was elected uh, to, to the papacy in 1978. And uh, so, oh, oh, I guess you're going to figure this out, but uh, I was about 10 years old. And so, basically, I grew up with St. John Paul II sense at, at a school, all the way from high school and then into the seminary. I was blessed to have the chance to meet him and talk with him personally, like over at the mass at his chapel and then meet him afterwards. Um, if one of our, you know, the characters in our talk tonight, like the lesson, you might remember the name of the of Solidarity, had the chance to meet him and spend time with him. And I always laugh and, and even, we want to talk about uh, Pope Benedict, but as Cardinal Ratzinger, I actually had breakfast and lunch with him at the table. The people you run into. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but it's interesting as I'll come full circle now I'm standing here uh, to, to talk about this. And um, as Monsieur was mentioning while I was at Mount St. Mary's, I had the opportunity, and, and I don't know how I did it because now I would just want to fall asleep <laughs> at some point in the evening. But twice a week I was up down in Washington and the John Paul II student at, at that time was located at the Dominican House of Studies on the campus of Catholic U. But, uh, but again, I know coincidental, here's was a Dominican talking to us. I was there with the Dominicans at the JP2 Institute, also taught by some Dominicans at Mount St. Mary's as well. And the guys also thinking, you know, I was at the Mount, I was, you know, my last year of graduate studies there in seminary studies, I was down in Washington twice a week. I was in Allentown, St. Thomas More for my deacon assignment on the weekends. So I got a lot of mileage on that poor car that that year. No wonder why it died. I'm not pulling into the ground. But, 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 but all of that uh, was kind of a neat atmosphere to be in. Uh, you know, as John Paul II was, was Pope, we were learning about him and seeing the changes that were happening in the world in some ways be, because of him. Um, and so, I don't want to take a lot of time on in the introduction, so hopefully this works, so there we go. Uh, the topic you can't see just is 20th century, century European history. We're not going to do a big history lesson, it's just a few big points to remember. I don't know the age of everybody. Some of you may have lived through this, some people may be younger and it's, it's a little shaky, but if you think about the 20th century in Europe, you have a world war, okay, and you know, it was a disaster in Europe. So there was a First World War. Okay. There is a 1917 Russian Revolution throwing over Tsarist Russia. Bolsheviks come into power. Uh, 1922, you have these rise of dictatorships beginning again and again in Europe. 
There's a depression in 1929. And the depression here, too. It starts in, around 1929 there as well. And then we roll into the, the Second World War. Again, the decimation of Europe once again. And then and tucked within that is the Holocaust. You know, I cannot imagine what the impact of all of that was on the people of Europe. You think about the impact we see in the United States of troops going over the fight, but literally, as we're looking at pictures from Ukraine of the destruction, that is what they were experiencing there as well. You know, and, and over and over, and then just the natural part of a Holocaust sits in the background of all of this, because we're right in the middle of all of this with, with, with what begins to unfold. Also, 20th century Europe, and what else is going on about the end of a nuclear age? So, uh, arms and armaments have changed. We can literally destroy the world if we wish. You know? uh, in 1922 and to 1991, the USSR's existence, I was trying to figure this out. If you're basically under 31 years of age, you never existed in a world where the USSR was in existence. Think about that with our younger, uh, you know, people who sometimes get lost in these conversations. The units are going to exist before. Uh, of course, NATO in 1949, that is, is formed. There's a Cold War. And then in, in, information and communication, communication technology is taking off. The world is becoming smaller. We're much more connected again. Think of where we are today. You can pull out your phone, pull up, you know, uh, TikTok, even, which used to be just like people dancing, making funny videos, and you can see the war unfold in front of you in Ukraine, right from where we're where sitting. So we have gone a long way, and all that was developing kind of as we make our, our, our way through the 20th century in, in Europe. I'm trying to keep, trying to keep us focused in Europe because we want to talk a lot about Poland and the USSR. And then also liberal democracies are on the rise in Western Europe. So the world is changing rapidly. And then within the USSR, again, the revolution, yeah, the Soviet's existence from 1922 to 91. But of course, so let's say in response to NATO, I think it was the only reason, but a Warsaw Pact uh, in 1955. And, and then the satellite states that are, are brought in, not necessarily completely into the USSR, but essentially they all are communist governments and they're all part, are, are part of Warsaw. It's all part of what we need to keep in mind. But into the scene in around 1985 and 91 is this change in, in the Soviet Union. It's uh, Glasnost and Perestroika under Gorbachev because the Soviet Union internally is coming apart, basically. And, and he sees it. They need reform, so he begins the reform movement. But tucked within that, there are all kinds of uh, what are primarily, by this point in time, uh, I'll call them bloodless revolutions, particularly first in the satellite states as they begin to break away from the Soviet Union, eventually the Baltic states, and then the USSR itself will essentially dissolve into what's, what's left of is now the Russian Federation, only a a portion of what it, what, what it once was. So that's a hundred years of history. There's no test on this. Okay. <laughs> no. No. And so um, for, for Poland, who sits right in the middle of all of this, okay, Poland has a phenomenally interesting history, and I cannot possibly even keep that straight. Because at times you have Poland, at times it's, it's partitioned, it's attached to other kingdoms. It, it's a long history of, at times of independence, and also uh, basically non-independence, of not being free. And if you're in Poland, I had a chance to be in Poland a few summers ago for a really nice tour. And I got to go to John Paul II's house and want to check out to go to his house and things. But in different parts of the country, it's amazing how different the cuisine is when you eat. Like I went to Poland and think I'm seeing pierogies and kielbasa everywhere. That's what I suspect. 
You get to some areas that's actually here because German. I asked them, who are eating German? They said, because the Germans occupied us for so long, we picked up their cooking habits. You know, in another part of Germany, it, it can be a bit, a bit more Russian because of the Russian or Prussian or Austrian, just because of how long they were under sometimes people of uh, other countries. So it picks up in, in their language, their culture, at times it was a little, a little surprising. But from 1795, for our purposes, 1918, they are not an independent state. Okay, just to keep that in mind. However, after the First World War, they do have a period of independence. Okay. From 1918 to 1939, they are, it's the Second Polish Republic, they're independent, but threatened on all sides. It's, it's an uneasy in, in, in independence. Okay. And I'd like to point that out because essentially that is the, the childhood and the teenage years of Carol Wojtyla. Sometimes we forget that. His young years, he experiences a free country. Then, the repression. <laughs> so he gets to see both sides of this. You know? And when you think about it, before that they were not free, every story he heard growing up was probably about how horrible it was when they were, uh, uh, when, when they were partitioned and governed by other people. But then the Nazi occupation happens, and Following upon World War II, eventually Yalta and all of the rest of that that history, the Polish People's Republic is established, but it has a communist government. Again, they are they are kind of independent, but not really because they answer to the Soviets. And as long as they do what the Soviets want, it's okay. If they don't, the tanks come in. You know, essentially, and that will be a threat. There's a solidarity movement in 1980 that, that takes off in Nantes. And that's what, what kind of the key leaders of that is like the Lessa. Okay, and that will begin to change things. And we'll, we'll, we'll see that later. And then eventually freedom once again for the Third Polish Republic in 1989. And they continue as a free state. Today, leaning much more to, to the West at this point and made open things rather than towards the, the East. Now, how about St. John Paul II? In 1920, he was born in Norwich. Okay. But sadly, he has a very sad personal life. His mother dies in 1929. And that's the year he receives his first communion. We can decimate and destroy it all. That's the misuse of power. But after all those big things, what does he direct it to? And the lack of respect for the life it's important because he's not just going to talk about these meta concepts out here somewhere. He's going to keep driving down to a personal level. And there's nothing more personal than the life of a young woman. So it's already, again, yeah, in, in his very first concept world. He was a father of Vatican II, so he goes right into Vatican II. The truth is only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take light. Christ there reveals the man to himself and brings to light his most high calling. That's why Christ is so important in this discussion right now. Because that's how you come to know what the true dignity of, of the human person is. It's in Christ Jesus. Human nature, by the very fact, is assumed in Christ, has been raised in us to a dignity beyond compare. You have no idea what your dignity is in the eyes of God. He's, he's yelling this at, at a world that needs to hear a message. Right, the incarnation of the Son of God and certainly not himself with each. Again, he's not just going to let it hang out here, this fuzzy, oh, he united himself to mankind, isn't that nice? He united himself to you. Meditate upon that for a moment this evening, of your union to Christ personally. That's what he's, again, it's meta and then down to the personal. This is a phenomenal movement and phenomenological as well. The difference of placing the cross is demonstrating the dignity of man given back into his life in the world. Again, he is, he is in his first and second world, he's driving the themes home already. The church, the church is fundamental function, every age, particularly 
and ours is to direct the man's gaze, to point the awareness, expressive men towards the mystery of God. That all men be familiar with the profundity of the redemption taking place in Christ Jesus. That's the church of Rome. That, that is kind of it. We are here at the service of Christ to bring people to Christ, to Christ to you, and to direct our gaze and our reflection upon all of this. But he has some concerns. He mentions them. The phenomenon of atheism is various forms. Human beings as program organized and structured as a political system. He's addressing communism. But in some, you know, in some ways, though, he's doing it without trying, without throwing it right there on the page. You just have to read and go, oh, is that what they're about? And Christ calls this meet and unite around him. It's interesting, the uh, countries of Europe who slaughtered one another in the First and Second World Wars were, were primarily Christians. They united around the wrong people, their dictators, their totalitarian leaders, and if they had united around Christ, none of it happens. Think about it. If you unite around Christ as Christians, none of us transpire. That's where we are to be united. It's, it's around Christ himself. And that's who we have to be. And that's who the people of Poland are going to have to be. United around Christ. That's what's going to, what he's going to write right home. You'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Because again, they're being fed a lie. That's what his point is. Communism is a lie. Just a lie. And, you're, and, 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 and they're, they're trying to feed it. To the world. The world should perform more to man's surpassing dignity. The church can abandon man for his destiny, unbreakably linked with Christ. And there's a primacy of persons over things, and the superiority of spirit over matter. Persons are more important than things. I remember uh, you know, my, my mom would uh, say that when we were starting to drive. Be careful. I don't care about the car, I care about you. You know, if we bang the car, we're going to hear about it. But still at all, the first question would have been, are you okay? What were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but there's a primacy of the person over the thing. And then also, the spirit over matter, because atheism is a materialistic philosophy. Ultimately, and so is communism. They're materials. They don't really believe in the spiritual. There's nothing spiritual about them. They, they, it, it, it's, and he's despising this from the materials. So you've got to become a slave of things. That's kind of a, a, you know, a little stuff against capitalism. Because when he comes to the United States, everybody thought he was going to talk against communism. He actually talked about, about capitalism in the third substance. He's an equal opportunity criticizer because the church aligns itself to no economic or political system. It aligns itself to Christ and the gospel. And we should praise what's good in any society and we should correct what isn't. So, yeah, we can become a slave of things. Because, you know, the point is it's for the entire world. Of economic systems. Again, we're back into communism and things. We can be a slave of production. Again, used like hogs in, in the machine and thrown away and, and discarded. And even slaves to our own products. We make the stuff that enslaves us. Isn't that sick? We produce the very things that enslave us. Sometimes. Talk about a really, really weird world in which, which we live. And so a materialistic society commends man to such slavery. Once we lose sight of the spiritual, and, and be transcendent. Then he brings the principle of solidarity. And what will the labor movement be named in Poland? Solidarity. Solidarity. Remember some of these? I said, it's, it's been a while, hasn't it, since we've heard this? Yes, yeah, it's been, been, been a little while. It needs to be respect for each one's dignity and freedom. The violation of the rights of man goes hand in hand with the violation of the rights of the nation. If you're going to violate that person's rights, you might as well hope you can violate anything. Down goes the rest of the rights of 
estimation, and it starts with a very unique individual person's personal estimation. You know, don't talk about the rights of the nation. No. Tell me about how you treat that person and their rights. And I'll tell you what type of relation you have. That, that's his point. The essential sense of the state as a pilgrim unit consists in understanding people who was our master and sovereign of their own destiny. Let the free elections happen. Let, let them be in charge of themselves. Again, united around Christ, build up Christian principles. That's already been said. The rights of power can only be understood on the basis of respect for the objective and the viable rights of man. And any other use of power is on this use of power. In a world where they just come through totalitarian dictatorships and all of the rest, think of what he's saying and what he's correcting. And this is only a little tiny part of the encyclical. I'm just picking out the church, picking the pieces I need for tonight. There's a human rights is a profound concern to the area of social justice. as a measure which can be tested in the light of political bodies. So again, human rights. And these will become the reasons for the revolutions. It's not economic systems. They don't fight over, over how much they're getting paid or things like that. But the less we even say that. You know, yeah, they had to worry about bread and sausages, but they were worried about social justice and, and the rights of people. Yes, because that's the message that can be driven home to a truly Christian nation. The talent of Irish religious freedom, or in contrast to the man's dignity as objective rights. The atheist country, communist countries, of course, they were trying to wipe out religious freedom in religious times. And freedom is a great gift only when we know how to use it, conscious of everything that is our true good. But this freedom, Christ has set us free. It's a correction on the modern idea of freedom. Freedom is not for you to do whatever you want. That's animal. Freedom is freedom to pursue what is good and true and beautiful and right. That's what we Because that, you know, that's why Christ has set us free. So we can pursue those types of things. And, also, and the ultimate of that, the ultimate truth, goodness, and beauty is God Himself. So, we're out of our depth of homies. Again, it's like a like cherry pickers. It's, that's only a little, little bit of it. But then he goes off to Victory Square in Warsaw. Okay? We're only still in 1979. I'm already exhausted, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and he's already been to Latin American things. And, you know, I'm writing cyclicals, and now he goes off to Poland for a nine-day trip. Okay. We're only looking at day one, the first time then. Because, again, my senior told me I cannot go five hours. So, <laughs> where does he start there? That his being there is the work of divine providence. God knows this. It's divine providence that he is there with them at that time. Now we back to their thousand-year Catholic history. Again, Poland is essentially a Catholic country. You know, there is one point, it's not, I don't have the recent statistics, but coming out of like, the Cold War and things when Poland is reconstituted with, with much smaller borders than it once had. I think they said, now again, sadly, the Holocaust has also happened. And the expulsion of the Jewish public, they're like 97% Catholic. They're just a dripping Catholic country. Yeah, a few summers I was there, I was looking, there were, there were churches on three different corners. It was a weekday, and the churches were full, and they were out on the street for daily mass. Weekends, the masses begin like Saturday evening, go all the way through the night, they start in the morning, all the way through Sunday evening, and they're packed at every room. They are a dripping Catholic country. <laughs> You know, so it's like that. Yeah, yeah, that's what he's talking to. They have a thousand year history of Catholicism, and then he mentions this figure, St. Stanislaus, one of the great patrons of the country, who was the, the Bishop of Krakow, gave up his life defending his people. And where was John Paul II, the Archbishop of? Krakow. He stands as a successor of Stanislaus. 
So they're called to be responsible witnesses who proclaim Christ with humility and conviction and ask that they be capable of many great duties and obligations as he fails. It's a constant theme of his maturity and responsibility. He does not want them off the rails and riding in the streets. That's not what he's calling them to. You know, there's a stoicism to this that it's going to get rough. And you cannot break. You can't lash out. You can't get violent. Because if you do, all of this program <coughs> comes apart where he's trying to break this. That's not how Christ could act. You have to be exemplary Catholics in this. And Christians at the heart of this. Your mind's on Christ's mystery man. He promised to live the moment of the age. That's your mission. Proclaim Christ. In the face of atheist to communist, proclaim Christ. No. And do not be afraid because Christ is with you doing that. You're never alone. And, and right now it's around the Pentecost period and the Feast of the Most Holy Trinity, so he winds those in, but that Pentecost feast is important in the moment. He says to, to Poland, the church brought Christ. Remember before he has talked about the mission of the church to bring Christ to the world? Well, the church brought Christ to Poland. Okay. The key to that great and fundamental reality that is man. That's what they brought to Poland. Christ is the key to all of this. And for man cannot be fully understood without Christ. This is homily in Warsaw, a victory square. Christ cannot be kept out of the history of man in any part of the world. The exclusion of Christ from the history of man is an act against man. We're in Warsaw under communist occupation of basically the country, to speak of it. Now, I know they're supposed to be free, but it's a communist government. It is said that three million people packed into Warsaw with this. The communist authorities were terrified. They were looking out the upper windows wondering what is about to happen in our country. Because all these people are being riled up by this Polish guy who's a Poland. You know, and this is, and, and I said, he, this is what he's proclaiming to them. You can't exclude Christ. You can't exclude any of this. It's impossible without Christ to understand the history of the Polish nation. You would have loved to have been there that moment, wouldn't you? Because somewhere in the middle of all of this, the clapping began and the cheering began. They say it went on for 14 minutes straight. And the people began to cheer, we want God. We want God in our schools. We want God in our homes. We want God in our work. That's what they were beginning to yell in Polish. Not throw down the communists. Not, viva la revolución. None of that. It's a direct demand. This is what we want. And we will sell it for nothing less. Don't want to mess with Polish. It could be very headstrong. And so then it's in victory square, the capital of Poland, asking through the great Eucharistic prayer, yeah, this is mass for me, that Christ will not cease to be first open book of life of the future, our Polish future. He's just driving one point on after the next. It, it's the common. That's what he's talking about. And we are before the tomb of the unknown soldier. Again, the other concepts were very big, weren't they? Where does he go now? It's very personal. The unknown soldier. It's the tomb that he's in front of. It's the personal philosophy. That's all that was for the head. This is the heart. In how many places our native land has that soldier fallen? They've just been through wars. That's their relatives, who they all knew. In how many places in Europe and the world has he cried with his death that there could be no justice without the independence of Poland? Right in front of the communist. On how many battlefields has a soldier given witness to the rights of man and inviolable rights of the people? Because that's his message. It's not about economic systems. Somebody else can worry about that. It's not about political systems. He's driving the message home. It's about human rights and dignity in Christ. And so just this is a little scripture. The seeds that fall to the earth will bear fruit. Oh, here we go. How have we kind of seeded the ground? In what way? 
from the battlefields. Martyrdom in concentration camps or in prisons, political prisons. Of our daily toil, the sweat of us were out in the fields, the workshops, the mines, the foundries, the factories. That's where we work out our salvation with Christ. And then we drive a little more home, and the task of raising children. Talk about sweat of brow. The creative work in universities, in places of national culture, prayer, service of the sick, very much now. You know, the service of suffering, the abandonment. All of that is which Poland is made. That's what's made Poland. To, to where they are that day. And of course, if you know the Polish, they have a great devotion to the Blessed Mother. Here she comes. All that in the hands of the Mother of God hands it all to Mary. Who is present, I, I, I just know what this who is present at the foot of the cross of Calvary, at the very moment of the redemption, and is, and is present at Pentecost for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And the history of, and I love this, what, how did Hitler refer to Germany? The Father. He won't even use the terminology to talk about the country. Because a mother loves and nourishes and nurtures. It's the mother that is talking about. Shaped by generations. You know, see the anonymous. You know, and it's shaped by even the unknown and the anonymous who is possibly almost everyone standing He didn't stop here. This is only a four-page homily. This is all packed. I can just imagine carrying on, and you know the sternness of J.P. too. When, when, when he put his foot down and, and, and set the chin, everybody's getting in here, but it's a very short, surprisingly, you know, for, for this. It's not a homily. Okay. Right. And so, I am the son of the land of Poland, and who am also Pope John Paul II. I cry from the depths of this millennium, I cry the vigil of Pentecost. Let your spirit descend. This is the type right here. Let your spirit descend and renew the face of the earth, the face of this land. Amen. That's, that's where the Bahamut ends, and in Warsaw. Now again, there are eight more days of this across Poland. It, it, it is said that, that at least one third of Poland saw him in person. And almost everybody else on TV or radio. And as soon as it will be the last time in Poland he can these kind of audiences, because in a moment we'll talk about that, the Iron Curtain drops a bit in Poland and they're not allowed to have public gatherings like this and stuff. Still, still look at the future, but the other times he goes, he can't have big crowds like this. And you might be wondering, how did John Paul II learn to talk to crowds like this? One, he was an actor. Things, but that's usually small. It's interesting. The Communist Congress, because they wouldn't allow the church in Poland to use media. They couldn't use radio, they couldn't use TV, they, the only thing they could do is talk to big crowds. So he grew up as a, as a priest, basically, and as a bishop, talking to crowds in public. You know, it's why he, he gets, you know, I know they put him on TV, but he wasn't a TV personality, he wasn't John Paul II. He, he lived in the big crowd and connected with the big crowds. That's really what he had to do all the time in Poland. Oh, there, I, I simply have a little bit of time now. In 79, you nine day papal visit to Poland. This is a spiritual victory over time. Now, in 1980, Solidarity is founded. The Solidarity knows the, it's, it's a union of Poland in a Poland where unions were not allowed. Because okay, they didn't want any kind of organized groups. But, but it takes off. That began 
shipyards begins to spread through Poland, and it's a danger to the government because the people are now organizing the gaming power. There's an 18 day standoff eventually where they will do nothing, everything shuts down. And the government's getting nervous. And they're demanding consent. Like I said, it's a phenomenal union movement. They're not just talking about we want more wages, we want more vacation time. This is going for a deep enough. Look what they're asking and, and what they get. Freedom of speech, press, religion, release of political prisoners, prohibition of reprisals, public economic transparency, right for to participate in discussions on reform. And they get them. Not happily. That's going to cause a problem in a moment. But that's how much power the union had all of a sudden. But then in 1980, there's a plan. And when I say stage, I mean they were staged and ready to, to invade. I don't mean like fake. I mean they were in their staging areas. The tanks are at the border. For the invasion of Poland to schedule, schedule for December 8th. It's the Soviets. They saw what had just happened, and they went, not in our union. You're not going to gain these kind of rights. And so they had, they had planned for months for her invasion of Poland. But it's neat, one of, and remember, Poland is under the communist kind of umbrella. And, and they answered to the Soviets, so there are. But one of the Polish colonels didn't like the Russians. So he's feeding information to the West and to the back. So as this is getting more and more ready, behind the scenes, countries are already calling and, and telling the Soviet the liberation of the time, um, don't think about it. The, you know, don't even think about it making more. You know, it came from the Vatican, it came from the United States. You know, it's interesting because Jimmy Carter made the first call on, on the hotline to say, you don't want to do this, because maybe you see the guy who's coming after you. You know, he's an anti-communist, you're, you're not going to like this. France stepped in, India stepped in, I thought literally country after country were on the hotlines going, don't even think about it. You know. And the Soviets back down, but I was like, it, it was planned for December 8th. What's December 8th? Feast of the Immaculate Conception. I think Mary said, you're not big my whole land. <laughs> no, not happening. December 8th. Well, what happens when the Russians are done? They say, okay, that's not going to work. What do we do? 1981, the assassination attempt of the Pope. Decapitate the leader. Now, again, I know sometimes people say, were they really behind it? Any report that's ever been written? You know, let me tell you, Muhammad al the, uh, the assassin, mysteriously he escaped from a Turkish military prison. That's interesting. The next place he shows up, if I remember correctly, is at a Syrian training camp run by the KGB. Then he shows up in Bulgaria, again, communists, I call them all the KGB, but they don't have names for the BTs, the countries, where he's, where he's living in a luxury hotel under the hospitality of the security services of Bulgaria. The next place he shows up is Zurich. At a meeting, and the next thing you know, he's attempting to shoot the Pope. Connect the dots. You know, how did he go from Turkish military prison to, yeah, yeah. And every court of the United States, Italian, they've all studied it. They said, no, the Soviets were behind this. It was, it was the next attempt to stop all of this. And that doesn't work. You know, he gets injured, what have you, but he lives. So, Next, and this is like a blueprint of, you know, kind of the time period and how they did all the things. Well, if that didn't work and that didn't work, we'll declare martial law. That's 81 to 85, an attempt to stamp all of this out from internal. They simply ordered the Polish army to turn its own people. Because again, they answer to the Soviets. Okay. So, on December 13th, martial law is declared, the soldiers turn on their own people. 5,000 leaders of solidarity were arrested in one night in prison. 
Tell me this wasn't planned. They ran the 5,000 leaders and imprisoned them. And I put in Croatian knowledge and finance and public pressure because that's kind of what's going on from the other nations. It, it, it's kind of interesting. While this is going on, what do the Polish people need? The communist authorities have shut down the press, forms of communication. The information age has moved along. Guess what the United States is channeling through the Vatican to the other fax machines. American fax machines were found all over Poland so they could communicate with each other. What else? Photocopiers. That's what they desperately needed. They needed to copy and get, get, get things headed out in, in the underground. That's all being funneled through all kinds of channels. There's certainly financing getting funneled through all kinds of funky channels to, to, to help them survive. And then also public pressure constantly on um, the during this period. Uh, 78 died at the hands of the secret police, including uh, Father Jerzy Kuleczko, who was kind of the on-ground face of the Solidarity Movement for the Catholic Church. He was at the shipyards celebrating mass, hearing confessions. And so again, they tried to, you know, kind of, well, they do kill him. It's not that they beat him to death. It was horrible to have a chain through the river. But, the underground kept the vision alive. His body was found. There was a public funeral for him. Hundreds of thousands showed up, even against communist wishes, and the Pope showed up for him. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, it is exactly at his true meaning that it happened to him. But that was the sacrifice that was being called for. Um, there are more people visits, but as I said earlier, they, they, they can't do the crowds like they did at the first. But it still keeps going. It gives you to encourage the people. Uh, from 1983 to 89 in East Germany, it's a beginning to spread. This is just one little example. Uh, the, this is a Lutheran pastor <coughs> on this. And every Monday at 5 o'clock in the church, they would have prayers for the conversion of East Germany. Well, eventually, that rose in October 9th of 1989 to 70,000 people. The communists brought in 40,000 troops. They were expecting a revolution. The people had candles, they prayed, they sang hymns, they walked through the midst of the machine guns, and it says not one stone was thrown through a window, not one cap was knocked off of a police officer, it was a completely peaceful religious demonstration. The soldiers wouldn't fire them. There was no reason to fire them. Uh-oh. Have I talked my microphone out? Tell him. Yeah, do it. And unbeknownst to them, they're out praying for it form and change of their country, and at that moment, the Berlin Wall was falling. Okay. <laughs> so by, by 1989, we have all kinds of revolutions. I have revolutions, but again, they're just peaceful. It's like one satellite state after the next is, is, is beginning to break away. It's Poland first. Then I just some of the others just remember the name. It, it, it's Hungary, it's East Germany, Czechoslovakia. They're all peaceful. Romania, I put it. It was almost peaceful. They almost got it right, the poor Romanians. Until they brought the leader of the country and his wife out to the wall and shot them. They almost made it. But that was the worst of it, I think, in Romania. But it was a shock. Everybody else was getting it right. It was like, okay. No bloodshed, let's just make it happen. The poor Romanians, they just were so angry. <laughs> yeah. So it, they almost made it with, to, to the bloodless level. Then that's where the Baltic states, and then eventually, the, the, yeah, you're getting into the true Soviet Union now, Belarus, Ukraine. Okay, and then on Christmas Day, 1991, the great Christmas present, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, basically, and the establishment of the Russian Federation. Um, you know, 
there's, there's a lot of other history in the background that we don't need to go over, but Corbett Elliott is a writer, a researcher, and she says, Carol Rosita had conflict or conflict with communism was ultimately conflict in the realm of spirit. Communism is unambiguously atheist. Its premise is that man is a unit and engaged a, a court and engaged in a class struggle, which after a bloody revolution promised to produce a new man perfected by the political leaders. That's atheism. That's communism. But Carol Rosita knew that man is made in the image of God, created for a purposeful life on earth. And with the eternal this is a very different vision of, from what he was competing against. You might be taking care of Pope John Paul II as a political fault who vanquished communism, but that would be untrue. His position challenged communism in the metaphysical realm, not in the political realm. He understood the air of communism lay in its fundamental understanding of man, who is not merely the unit of labor engaged in perpetual class struggle, but a creature in the image of God with his soul and the eternal. These are the tenor narratives. And he, would, and he was convinced, as we should be as, as, as Catholics and Christians, that that is the vision of the human person, the truth of the human person. Whitaker Chambers was once a communist agent, but changed his uh, allegiance and returned to, to America. He said, the attraction of communism is as old as, as the Garden of Eden. The promise that we shall be as gods. There have been two faiths on trial in the 20th century, faith in God and faith in man. And that was really the fight that was being contested before constantly telling you that's what your faith needs to be, in, in God alone. And of course, once you do that, the dignity of man is a lie. So Connie's envision of man without God, Jacob who knew this was true deep in his moments. He lived under the lash of totalitarianism. He saw it. His answer to communism was to overcome evil with good, to answer his threats of violence with faith and non-violence, but straight to the deepest truth about the nature of man, his intrinsic dignity, his capacity for good. Jacob to inspire every person who was honestly seeking the truth itself. And so did he sparked a peaceful revolution that shattered communism by transcending it. The end. Senior, I will hand this back over to you.
intercession of John Paul II. We know that uh, JP2, in the midst of everything else, uh, a lot of people pray for him for healing, especially he with his Parkinson's disease. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Merciful God, I pray with thanks and gratitude for the great spiritual gift of St. John Paul II's apostolic life and mission through his heavenly intercession. Please grant me the following petition, which I mention in the silence of my heart. Grant also that I may grow in love for you and proclaim boldly the love of Jesus Christ to all people. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the first day of the Holy Father's Medina. Dear St. John Paul, you preach the future starts today, not tomorrow. As I start these nine days of prayer with you, I thank you for reminding me that with God's help I can begin again, but I need to start now, not as some distant point in the future. Your words are encouraging and inspiring to me. Please be with me as I progress through these nine days of prayer with you. Dear Lord, you are the greatest healer. You gave St. John Paul II to the entire world to show us how much you love us. With your mighty power and through his intercession, we seek healing, not just of our physical body, but our emotional, mental, social, and spiritual health as well. In keeping with your greatest commandment, we will love you with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and with all our strength. We will also love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. What is Mary Lou and Choir sending us home with? We're going to do number 600, Susie Pay. Take glory and then receive. Have number 600 in your cradle book.